Commissioner Art Museum. My name is Oriana Siocolo, and I'm the Director of Programs here. And I'm delighted to welcome you to a program organized in support of the special exhibition, um, American Icons, Elvis and Ali, a show that we opened about a week ago. And today's program celebrates the work of Alfred Wertheimer. The exhibition is entitled Elvis at 21. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, our local sponsors for the exhibition, their Univest, and additional support from Worth and Company. So thank you for your support. Today's program has been sponsored by the Smithsonian Community Grant Program funded by the MetLife Foundation. And they have also sponsored um, all of the special exhibition programs. Um, I hope you consider coming back. On Sunday, we are showing Jailhouse Rock. On May 1st, we are welcoming the curators of the exhibition to come in for a panel uh, discussion about um, Elvis and why he matters. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers today, Al Wertheimer and Marquette Fawley. Soon after graduating from Cooper Union's School of Art, Al Wertheimer began his career as a photojournalist publishing in such popular magazines as Life, Paris Match, Look, and Colliers. When RCA Victor asked him to photograph the label's newest recording artist in 1956, he turned the publicity assignment into a unique opportunity to document Elvis Presley on the threshold of superstardom. The exhibition includes 40 large format photographs that chronicle Elvis's dazzling emergence in a pivotal year, 1956, a time when Elvis could sit alone at a drugstore lunch counter before he became an icon, and constant security created walls between him and his fans. Mr. Wertheimer's other subjects include Eleanor Roosevelt, Nina Simone, Dion and the Belmonts, Annette Funicello, Paul Anka, Rip Torn, Daddy Grace, Elizabeth Taylor, and Leonard Bernstein, among, among many others. He also covered the 1960 presidential campaigns of John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. As a documentary cinematographer, he worked as one of the principal cameramen on the original film, Woodstock. Joining Mr. Wertheimer is Marquette Folly, who's the project director at Smithsonian Institution Travel <coughs> Exhibition Service. She also is the project director of the exhibition, Elvis at 21. Her educational discipline rests in African American cultural studies with the inclusion of art and literary criticism. She has over 20 years of pro professional career association with the Smithsonian Institution. And her current position is project director and exhibition developer for sites. She oversees, conceives, and develops exhibitions and related programming. And she's been very helpful in organizing all of our public programming here at the Michener. The following exhibitions are some of the exhibits that she has directed. 381 Days, the Montgomery Bus Boycott Story, Lunchbox Memories, and Close Up in Black, African American Film Posters. As a member of the National Museum of American History Division of Musical History, their curatorial team, she worked to expand the jazz holdings of the Smithsonian under congressional mandate, celebrating jazz and the art of Duke Ellington. And now, please welcome Marquette Folly and Albert Hyman. Thank you, Zoriana. Thank you, everyone, for being here, but especially thank you to Michigan for having a good, excellent freedom of intellectual curiosity to marry Elvis Presley and Muhammad Ali. Pretty impressive installation. Alfred Wertheimer. I was reading about you just uh, sometime last night, and there's a writer who says, you, as an admirer of the David Douglas Duncan School of Eloquent, documentary realism was, in my opinion, um, absolutely made perfect for the moment of Elvis that you caught in 1956. 
you chatted about what you were doing and why you were doing it, and you said to me, I'm interested in the moments before the moment Rasan writes about. Well, here we are. That was at 21. It was quite a moment. Pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, you know, you have to bring yourself back. You don't have to, but I, I do. Uh, thank you for coming, by the way. Uh, it's appreciated. Uh, you see, when time goes by, and right now, 54 years have gone by since I first photographed Elvis. Uh, at the time, I was 26 years old. I graduated from Cooper Union, had done a two-year stint in the United States Army, came out, and it was my first year in photography, professional photography where you can actually send out an invoice and expect to get paid. <laughs> so that it's, it's a, it was bread and butter. And then one day, uh, you're there in the dark room, and uh, you get a call from Ann Fokino, who happened to be the public relations. If I, if I get too far off course, uh, let me know. I'll, have, uh, I'll bring you in. She, Ann Fokino, um, RCA. RCA Victor. That was Elvis's record company. But I didn't know uh, Elvis Presley at the time. As a matter of fact, uh, I never heard of Elvis Presley. And uh, this was now uh, around March 10th of 1956. And Ann said, Al, uh, we haven't got a thing in our file. Uh, no, she said, are you available on the 17th of March, which happened to be St. Patrick's Day? And I'm busy printing in the dark room, and uh, I said, well, for you, Anne, of course I'm available. Little did she know I needed the $50 to help pay my $75 rent that I had to pay every month to David Linton, whose who studio I shared. And, uh, and so I said, uh, what would you like me to do? She said, I'd like you to come down to CBS Studio 50, which was on 50th Street and Broadway. It's now the David Letterman Studio. And uh, we'd like you to photograph the Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey show called Stage Show, which was a variety show that was produced by Jackie Gleason. Some people here might remember Jackie Gleason. And, and, uh, and I said, sure, that's fine. I mean, uh, 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 Tommy Dorsey's uh, Glenn Miller. Harry James, these are my kind of musical, uh, tasteful people, besides a little bit of Mozart and Beethoven. So she says, no, I, I don't want you to focus on uh, Tommy Dorsey or Jimmy Dorsey. What I want you to do is I want you to focus on Elvis Presley. Well, there was that 15 seconds of silence, and I said, Elvis who? <laughs> Never heard of him. Who is he? Now, this was the fifth performance that he had on the, on the, on stage show, and he hadn't had gotten a gold record yet. He didn't get his first gold record till April of that year. This was now March. Alfred, as a matter of fact, he was so just emerging that the RCA um, manager who hired, uh, who signed Elvis, was feeling he'd made a bad decision. Did he? he was so emerging that though he had some regional prestige. They weren't sure he was able to do what they thought he could do. Elvis always knew. And for Anne, your colleague, talks about saying to RCA, listen, give me somebody I can make famous. Colonel Parker was the same way. He was so, she describes him, he, he meets them for the first time. And he comes in, and he has a buzzer in his hand. He shakes hands with a buzzer. And she says he was a very quick study, a cornball kid who was a quick study. He never made the same mistake twice. This was a kid who knew where he wanted to go. So when you saw him at the Dorsey Show, at Stage Show, what did you see? Well, I saw a very quiet, introspective person, and, uh, but I didn't know who he was. I mean, uh, Anne met me at the backstage uh, door, and there was the normal confusion of... Uh, of a rehearsal going on, because in those days there was no such thing as videotape. Everything had to be live. I mean, the image was good, live, but the only way it could be, it could be recorded was through kinescopes, which is, technically is taking 
a motion picture film, putting in front of a television tube and photographing the tube with all the little lines, and that way you had at least something to look at years later. And uh, if they didn't get thrown out, it wasn't until the end of 56 that Ampex uh, invented two-inch videotape, and then television really got started because it was very inconvenient to have East Coast broadcasters uh, broadcasting essentially at 8 o'clock at night, and the West Coast was just on the freeway going home from work. I mean, it, they needed to be able to take those shows, beautifully reproduce, fly them out to the coast, and then reprogram them at a more convenient time for West Coast viewers. So, at any rate, uh, here Anne is bringing me through this labyrinth of rehearsal, and we get to a small room, a dressing room, and there's normal mirrors on the on the wall with the bulbs, only the bulbs weren't lit, and there uh, this young man has his feet up on the table, and he's got argyle socks on, and there's another middle-aged man who is busy showing him something, and the, the younger man keeps looking at his fingers, and then Anne interrupts the conversation and says, excuse me, Elvis, and she's talking to the younger man. And uh, so now I knew who Elvis was. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she says, uh, this is Al Wertheimer. He's a photographer. He's going to be doing some photographs of, of you. I hope that it'll be all right and you'll cooperate. And Elvis basically says, sure, why not? You know, okay. But he keeps concentrating on his hand. And so uh, I become the shadow on the wall, or as some people quote me, the fly on the wall. I take out my two Nikon uh, single lens uh, split range finder cameras for those who are photo buffs um, that are painted black that was inspired by David Douglas Duncan because I saw a picture of him uh, somewhere in around the Korean War where he had his heavy parker on, had these two cameras around his neck and in those days everything was Leica, 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 Leica. But Leica did not make black cameras. And I figured if I could find a black camera with good lenses, I could become invisible. And therefore, I could get closer to the truth. See, I thought there's such a thing as truth in storytelling. That's a wonderful phrase. What? Eloquent truth. You get closer to the truth. Close Your truth. eloquent documentary. Without a lot of propaganda. Right? Yes. A lot of interference. And just take light reflections off people's bodies and objects, store them for future memories, and then occasionally release them. As a matter of fact, I did it almost two and a half thousand times, so that I have a vast collection, probably the earliest collection on Elvis, and of those, maybe 800 have been published. Now, for my old age, because I don't consider myself old yet, I'll release another four, five, six hundred, and maybe after I'm gone, they can release the rest of them. Uh, Al, I, I find your approach to photography yeah. at this period in 1956, mid-20th century, nothing but modern art. It is absolutely modern what you're doing. Available light, you capture this incredible moment, you're able to say to Elvis, I'm going to, I need to follow you. Your art, your modern art, it's just amazing. Art is about choices, I've, been, I've, I've read. You made choices. Well, you have to decide. I mean, you have to, de see, in the Army, I had a speed graphic that I was working with. And, uh, and the wax, these are the Women Army Corps ladies, they, 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 they ran a tight ship. And they said, Wertheimer, if you use your Leica camera or your contact and those little itty bitty 35 millimeter images and you don't use this four by five big negative, uh, you're out of here. And, uh, and I said, well, you realize I can get 12 pictures in the space of one, you'll have more, don't, don't break the rule book. Now the rule book said that when you came back from your assignment of two shots, you know, both sides of the holder, uh, you came back after you had it, the, the film developed, then you sat down with a crow quill pen and India ink, and you wrote the caption at the bottom of the four by five negative uh, uh, on the proper side, and then the caption and the photograph were married forever, so that when they put it into a glazing envelope and it would be filed, it would be filed and everybody knew who the person in the front row was, the middle row, left to right, et cetera, et cetera. It was 
It was a chore. There was no fun to it. Because typically, what you said was, could you move a little to the left, a little to the right? The lenses that you had on the 4x5 camera would not permit you to shoot in available light like this. You had to use flash bulbs. And they give you a flash bulb that could light up Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and, and when you photograph from maybe five feet away, you would make everything in the front rows cream cheese. I mean, it was bleached out. And the people in the back were dark. And then you had to try to adjust all that. So I said, you know what we could do? And they said, well, all right, what's he, what's he thinking about now? You could bounce the light off the ceiling and spread the light a little bit more. Even if you, if you take the, the flash gun off the camera and bounce it, you're out of here. So they were going strictly by the rule book, by what Kodak said, by what the, what the rules were set down. I said, I've got to get out of here if I'm ever going to do any kind of decent photography. But at least I knew what... They were coming up with sharp images. Yes, the images were very sharp. Because, because remember, a photographic dot, whether it's on a 35 millimeter slide uh, uh, frame, which is one by one and a half inches, or a four by five, the dot is exactly the same. But if the, if the gold standard is an eight by 10 photograph, that dot on the four by five only has to be enlarged two times, where the dot on the one that's an inch and a half has to be blown up maybe five, six times in order to achieve that eight by 10 frame. So naturally, the, 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 it'll appear sharper. But is sharper, is that a photograph, or does, is there more to a photograph than just sharpness? See, I contend that a photograph is, to some degree, the camera, to some degree, the lighting, to some degree, the photographer and what's going on up here, and to another degree, the subject. And, and what the subject is doing, whether the subject is involved, or whether you're busy posing that subject where it's really more a reflection of you coming off the subject than to find out what's really going on with the subject. Now, in the case of Elvis, getting back to him. In that dressing room with those rings and that available light. Well, the available light. Uh, see, the available light is, is, is very good. There's a great depth to available light. Uh, you, you, you see, there's two kinds of photography. There's the photography in the studio where you bring the subject into the studio, and then you have your assistant and your lighting people help you create a mood, and then the subject is basically there like a model, and you tell the subject what to do. Sometimes you'll trick them into coming up with a decent expression. Or you can be more risky. You can take your camera bag, be portable, know your skill in in what you're doing with very small negatives. The smaller the negatives, the more skill you need in order to get the most out of that negative so you can come up with a decent 8 by 10, 11 by 14 picture. And then, and then you take a chance as you go out there. I think I use strobe maybe on 2% of the photographs. The rest of it is all available light. Because it's there. It's there for nothing. You don't have to pay for it. It's, it's, it, it has great depth. There's lighting way back there. I mean, to light this room the way it is, I'd need uh, an hour or two. Just, and it wouldn't be as good as it is now. At any rate, uh, Elvis. So, so a decision has to be made. <laughs> All right, Elvis. So, you know, why he was, why he was such a wonderful subject? Well, hold on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Elvis, Elvis. I, I, I forgot to tell you who that other man was in the room. Uh, getting back to that story, uh, he was a ring salesman. Now, Elvis had ordered a ring, a good luck ring, uh, two or three weeks earlier on a previous uh, appearance on the stage show. And uh, the, the ring actually was a gold ring with a, a horseshoe uh, that was encrusted with diamonds, little diamonds, and a horse's head going from left to right. And, and he was admiring it. And, uh, and that the next time I saw that ring, besides out at Elvis Presley Enterprises, where now they sell those rings simulated for, I think, for $200 you can buy it. I'm sure the original one only cost Elvis maybe 50 bucks. But 
the, la the next time I saw that ring and it made an impression on me, that was like my beginnings with Elvis, the ring salesman. Uh, there, is a there is a small <laughs> park on Beale Street in Memphis. I don't know if the statue is still there, but it's a statue of Elvis that was opposite a restaurant that was owned by Elvis Presley Enterprise that went broke because they were charging too much or they, you had to wear ties to get in. And Beale Street is a very informal street. And there is a 12-foot image of a bronze Elvis holding this guitar. And on his, I think it's his left hand, there is a horseshoe ring with diamonds encrusted and a horse's head going across, but it's all in bronze. There are no diamonds. So now the, the, the fingers are this wide and the ring has expanded. So, that's the, so that ring became kind of a connection between the first time I met him and the 25th anniversary. At any rate... Uh, you think we should look at some of the images? Yes. Because you have a... Yes, we have a lot of them. I'm such a bother, aren't I? Yes. I'm such a nice. Uh, well, here, here, Elvis, you know, we're a little bit out of sequence. This, is, uh, this was on the, on the cover of a book that I put out. Uh, that was called Elvis at 21, New York to Memphis. And it's actually of him on a train. We're about a half an hour out of Memphis going back home after spending uh, some time in New York uh, recording Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. It happened to be precisely the 4th of July of 56. And uh, Elvis was in sort of a, uh, I didn't want to break the spell, by bringing the camera up to my head. You see, with these new modern cameras with the uh, digital, you can look at the, at the ground glass in the back, you don't, and you can tell when it's sharp. You don't have to actually bring it to your face, which in a way disturbs the mood, especially if you're, if you're in a meditative state. Here I'm sitting opposite him, and I see this, it's just a wonderful expression. So, it, it's the yin and yang of, uh, of, uh, of lighting. For instance, on the one hand, he's got his hand up like this, and he's hiding that... He's, there's the dark side of his face and the light side of his face. The dark side of his, of his face you can, it, is his public face. On the other hand, when he's got his hand up like that, that's his inner space, so that the inner and the outer are putting attention there. And you'll see that if you ever go to a museum to look at paintings, especially Rembrandt type paintings, and I'm not comparing this to Rembrandt, but on the other hand, he also has an inner personality and the outer personality. And that, if you took two halves of the outer and two halves of the inner, they would look like entirely different people. And that, to me, if you can capture it, is fine. But you're not going to capture it if you say to the people, now look at me, a little to the left, a little to the right, and hold that, and you click the camera. It's not going to happen. You have to allow them to be themselves, to, to allow them to, to be with their own thoughts. And in the case of Elvis, after looking at my contact sheets over and over again, I learned that when people are involved in doing things, <laughs> that are more important to them than having their photograph taken, you're going to get good photographs. Uh, anybody can do it if you know your equipment reasonably well. If on the other hand, the photograph is the most important thing at the moment that's happening in their life, it may be hit or miss, and the chances are it'll be mostly be missed because they're waiting for instructions. In my case, I let Elvis direct his own life. So he was the best director of his life I could find. And the thing about Elvis was, and I didn't know it at the time, what am I, a young photographer, my first year in photography, it's only later as you go over the context over and over and over and over again that you begin to realize that whatever he did, he did with intensity. When he combed his hair, he had a little lady's mirror in front of him, and he's combing the back of his hair. When he's chatting up the girl, he's focused dead on. When he's ordering a food, he's looking at the waitress up and down. Uh, when, he's, when he's trying to convince somebody that he's Elvis Presley and they should recognize him, and they say to him, well, how do we know you're Elvis Presley? 
and he says to them, uh, you know, he says, are you coming to my concert tonight? And, uh, and they say, well, who are you? That's, that's the point where he was in his career. And, uh, and then he finally points at me. He's now using me as a foil. And I'm standing on some cushions on a train, which I was taught never to do, but you do it to get the image. And then he says, you see that photographer over there pointing at me? And he says, do you think he would be taking my picture if I was an Elvis Presley? And they said, well, that makes a lot of sense. So then, in the meantime, he's got a big four-foot panda on his hip and, uh, and just to draw attention to himself. I mean, he never did anything directly. It was always a little bit circumspect. Anyway, he was a very intense fella, and we're going to move to the next photograph. I want to also oh, and identify the, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, by the way, so instead of bringing the camera up to my eye, I said, take a chance. So I, I, I set the thing on vertical, and I just pushed the button. I just, you know, rather than take a chance of bringing it up and kill the mood, the lighting was so good, his, his, he was thinking about what is he going to do tonight. He's, he, he's, he's about to give a concert at Rustwood Park. He hasn't been home for days. He's going to see his parents, uh, and uh, he's going to be able to relax. Uh, he just finished a successful Steve Allen show. Uh, and uh, he was he was sort of he was sort of had by singing to a hound dog. They were trying to contain him. Uh, his attitude was, I sing with my whole body. I'm not Frank Sinatra who just stands there with my arm. I'm not Mario Alonzo. I, I'm Elvis Presley. I need my body to get my voice out. And people in the Eisenhower era resented that idea because it was a little bit. You know, any time you move your hips, you're supposedly lewd. Well, he didn't think of it in those terms. They thought of it in those terms. So uh, now he was, ultimately, when he got to Rustwood Park, he said, tonight you're going to see the real Elvis Presley, not like what was on the Steve Allen show where he was Tumbleweed Presley, uh, written by Steve. At any rate, let's move along. Your image, your image, your approach to images, your approach to black and white, the dogs, the nuances, um, as you mentioned, this is out of sequence, but we discovered that this image was a signature image. We wanted to say to, the Smithsonian Institution wanted to say to our country, there's a reason why Elvis Presley matters. Most people only remember Elvis on Vegas, on Vegas' Strip. And what Al, what you caught, in our opinion, was the magic, the artistry, the revolutionary innovation, integration of all our sounds that was indeed Elvis. And in the exhibition, it is our signature. It is out of place, but it is perfect. And your description of how you got it speaks again to your eloquent documentary. Ability. Well, I knew. I didn't know how to do it any other way. Let's I mean, this is, the, and here he's only it's got two, two gold records. He hasn't been, he's just about to be recognized by the country as having talent. I mean, when I first met him, he didn't have any gold records. He was a regional southern, a uh, performer who was basically on the Hank Snow Jamboree, and you could tell he was on his way up. I mean, after all, he's only 21 years old here. He was on his way up because when you become part of a jamboree, the, the person who was named after that jamboree is, uh, uh, for, is, is the one who closes the show. He's the end star. And what happened was, over a period of time, Hank Snow said, you know, Elvis, you're getting more applause than I am. Why don't you close the show, and I'll sing before you? And eventually, Colonel Parker uh, booked Elvis at the Elvis Presley show, and then he booked 10 other acts. Of course, he did all the bookings, so he got a commission on each of the bookings. But, uh, but Elvis, when I met him, was... Uh, just beginning to take a, uh, you know, he was getting his first screen test in Hollywood. At the end of 56, he was a millionaire. Uh, but at the beginning of 56, he was just another performer who was hoping to make it. And what I realized was that once you begin to make it, you have forces behind you, such as RCA Victor, which is the record company. Then you have, then you have your manager, who is interested in booking live performances. Then you have, uh, who is it, uh, the William Morris Agency. They're interested in getting you onto television. You now become a property, and there's a lot of people who have a vested interest to see that you succeed. 
even though he probably did his best work for Sun Records, which is was just a little dinky record company in uh, in Memphis, and uh, who was it? it was his Phillips, uh, Sam himself. Phillips, uh, probably got the best music out of Elvis, and probably the be the best. The best record of Elvis ever done, in my opinion, was the Million Dollar Quartet, which involved Johnny Cash and uh, and Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, one other who Carl, Carl Perkins and Elvis, and that was an impromptu thing where Elvis just happened to come in at the tail end of a record session, and uh, and I think it was Phillips who left the, uh, the 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 microphones open and kept recording. And it was really so wonderful. If you ever get a chance to listen to that record, it's just terrific. Because it was spontaneous. Now, in my case, I never knew what would happen next. There'd always be surprises. So you have to be ready. And, and I like that challenge. I like the idea of not knowing what's going to happen next. So that, uh, let's, let's move on to another photograph. Uh, here, he's still able to walk into his hotel, at the Warwick Hotel, alone at night between the rehearsal and the evening performance, which was live. And uh, there's one man in the corner, but he had no bodyguards. It was just he and I, and, uh, and that was it. Walked into the hotel. So... Uh, and now he's actually putting the key in the door. <laughs> we love the loneliness of this, isn't it? The way this, the exhibition crescendos to the starburst. We love how you quote See, this. I love the understatement of the everyday things that we do. Uh, it doesn't have to be the high point. I mean, putting a key in the door, I mean, how many times have you done that? Uh, but nobody ever records that or documents it. Why? Because it's not important. Well, if it's not important, you'd never get in the door. <laughs> the key. So you have to do that. Uh, now, what happens when he gets in this door? Most interesting things happen behind doors. So it's your job, if you want to do journalism and, and know what things are all about, you've got to get past the front and in behind the door. What, whether it's a lawyer's office, whether it's the Pentagon, whether it's the presidential office, whether it's here at the museum. Things happen behind doors. Uh, yes, that's not to say they don't happen out on the front lawn, but the really interesting things uh, where people exchange ideas and such is, is in rooms and such. So now, uh, with the reason he is there on the couch is because he didn't want to stick around for three hours. Uh, at the at CBS Studio 50 till the evening broadcast would take place. So uh, he said, well, let's go back to the hotel. And he wanted to freshen up a bit. And uh, But of course, on the way back to the hotel, we stopped off at the Supreme Men's Shop on Broadway, where he was interested in buying a shirt for $2.50. <laughs> you could buy a tuxedo for $40. Those were the prices back then. And uh, so he gets to the he gets to the room, and there's an envelope on the uh, couch, and he doesn't say a word to me. I mean, he's quiet. I'm quiet. We both go about our business. I'm thinking about what what should I shoot now? I mean, there's nothing here except he's lying on a couch. I'm going, go ahead. I'm talking to myself. Go ahead and photograph him lying on the couch. See, the one thing that Elvis permitted uh, was closeness. See, when you, what, what, in the little that I had experience with other people, um, when you got within five to six feet of their presence, they started getting, is that, is that us that are doing that, that noise? <laughs> I guess it is. Uh, when you get within five feet of their presence, then, they, then you're in their space. But Elvis didn't get nervous about that. He permitted closeness. You could get as close as three feet to him, and he would act as normal as you would act from six feet. Well, what does that mean? Photographically, it means that you can now use a wide-angle lens and get all the texture, all the skin tone, the, the texture of clothing and stuff that you can't get from back here where I am. It would look different if I come close to you. And, uh, and then your personality plays off on his personality, and there is a dynamic that takes place where 
you have to stand your ground, and he'll stand his ground, and he, he liked that idea. Because I think in the back of his mind, and of course I'm, I'm saying this from a retrospect of 54 years, it's a long retrospect, uh, from, from, from his point of view, yes, he knew he was going to become famous. I didn't know it, and neither did most of the people there, because at RCA, they told me, Al, do not shoot color. We're not going to pay for it. Uh, this guy may disappear before we can, we can process it. And, and you know, color takes like two or three months to place. And what are we going to do with it if, uh, if he disappears? And, and, and we're stuck with, with two or three hundred dollars. You know? Oh my God, I, I shot color anyway. I didn't listen to it. I shot about 150 frames of color. I'm, I'm glad I did. Because the first cover of TV Guide which paid me five times what RCA paid me, which was just to cover my cost. Um, that was a TV guy cover. It was in color from the recording session. It's just a headshot, nothing fancy. So uh, this is an intimate shot, Al, and he's laying on fan mail. Well, he what he did was he found an envelope. He emptied the envelope. There were about a hundred letters inside. It was, and notice if you look close, it was three cents first class mail in those days. And uh, he started reading. He didn't say anything to me. Just flopped out. And, uh, and I knew we were going to have three hours of nothing to do. Uh, so he eventually uh, fell back on top of the mail and, uh, and, and he got tired and next thing I knew he was falling asleep. He actually, and then he pulled a pillow over his head, you know, one of the bolsters. And, and it seemed bizarre that you could get that close and he would permit it. And I said, well, I suppose that is publicity photography, but that's not what Ann Fulkino wanted. I mean, she basically wanted him by microphone, chatting up the girls, uh, shaking hands with, uh, you know, some of the personalities. Uh, but she didn't want to see the pimples on his back when he was in the, in the bathroom later on, the, 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 that's later on. What, I fell asleep also. I was cleaning up my gear and got it ready for the evening shoot, and I fell asleep. Next thing I hear this buzzing in the room. Sounded like bees. Turned out to be a Norelco electric shaver. And I grabbed one of my cameras and went over to the bathroom. And uh, I said to Elvis, who was now semi nude he had a towel over his shoulder, and they had just taken a shower. And um, I said, Elvis, can I come into the bathroom and continue taking photographs? He said, sure, why not? You know, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, doesn't everybody have photographers in their bathroom <laughs> shooting? Well, I, I didn't know the difference. This is my first year. That's my excuse. His excuse, he didn't know the rules either. And the colonel wasn't there. And, uh, and so I, I got in, and what did I find in the bathroom? Uh, I, find out, I find out that he used Vaseline hair tonic. That's one thing. The other thing I found out was he used a Morocco shaver. He also used a small lady's mirror to, to see what was going on in the back of his hair so he could comb it and do the little things back there properly. And, uh, and he also left the water running while he was brushing his teeth. Uh, well, okay. So we finally finished with ablu ab ablutions there. And we walked back to the studio, and... Uh, Do you have images of the, of the scenes you're talking about? Well, that's the problem. You'll have to look at the Elvis at 21, <laughs> New York to Memphis, which has 400 images in it. So let, let, let's see what else we find. Let's see what we have here, yes. Yes. Let's see, now, now he's getting a little tired, and he's falling back. You see he's got his lovely argyle socks there. They were never washed, they were just right out of the, you know, they still had the label, the manufacturing label on. And you see in the, in the foreground on the coffee table, you see these little bits of paper. And I said, Elvis, what are you doing? He's tearing up all his fan mail into little slivers. So I said, he said, well, I don't want anybody to read them, and I'll be darned if I'm going to carry them with me. So whatever I can't read, and some of these fan mails were like six, seven pages long. Uh, he tears them up, leaves them like a shredding machine, and that was it. He, he, uh, he uh, just fell asleep there. So, well now, this is a rehearsal shot, and the reason I can tell it's a rehearsal shot is because he's got no tie on. 
uh, in the, during the actual show, he had a white tire. Now the other thing is, you notice the knot in his guitar strap. Uh, well, his guitar strap broke. And so he said, well, would somebody go out and get me another leather guitar strap? Well, would you think in New York you could find a leather guitar <laughs> strap somewhere? No, they couldn't find it. So what happens is they come back with a clothesline. <laughs> and and, and he, um, he ties off the clothesline. It's the only time, I think, a national television broadcast ever broadcast. Uh, uh, excuse me, do you have a license to do this? <laughs> uh, every photographer needs a personal photographer in order to, to go through the day. Uh, is that blocking anybody? No. All right. So, um, so at any rate, uh, he puts the clothesline on, and it's, it's as if nothing was wrong. It, it, doesn't everybody play his guitar on a national broadcast with a clothesline? And of course, all of this was six minutes on the air. All of this rehearsal, all of this waiting around. You, you know, you had the dance act, you had the, the music, musicians, and, uh, and Elvis had two songs that he was allowed to sing. I forgot what they were. If you wish, you can read the book and it, it tells you that. I sometimes have to read my own book to remember the details. <laughs> but the overalls, I can remember. Uh, and that's Scotty Moore to his right. That was his earliest uh, sidekick. At the time, it was Bill Black on bass. Uh, DJ Fontana on drums, and usually the drummer is blocked out by either Elvis or by the bass player. He never gets any real credit. It's a, I think I have only two frames where I have all four of them separated that you can actually identify who the players are. And this is uh, this is uh, on the fifth performance, fifth performance of the Dorsey Brothers uh, stage show. He only had six altogether. And this was on St. Patrick's Day for whatever that's worth. Now, I call, you see, this is actual performance. He's got the time. I, this is, this picture I call Four Fingers. It used to be called Four Fingers and a Toe, but my niece said, Al, what do you need the toe for? It's just four fingers. Simplify. All right, it's simplified. So that's Bill Black who's raising his hand. You see, the drummer is blocked out. Uh, now, Elvis, this, this was called originally, see, I, I'm a little bit too verbose. It was called Jump for Joy. Nisa again says, Al, it's jump. That's it. Stop. So this, this picture is called Jump. And it, now you see the right shoulder of DJ Fontana. That's all you get. And you see uh, Scotty Moore there. And uh, these guys were with him till about 1960. And then he started getting involved with... Hollywood, and he got involved with the TCB band, taking care of business. As a matter of fact, I recently was at Radio City Hall in Manhattan, and they had the Elvis Presley show. Elvis stays the same age, and the musicians just keep getting older and older, <laughs> and they keep dying. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, the Sweet Inspirations, now I, I think they're hitting close to 70. When they first were with him, they were in their 30s, and uh, and, and what's, what's really spooky is when the guitar player, who's still alive, forget his name, but when he's in the same frame with Elvis, in the vertical 40-foot image, he's 27 years old. Now he's 68. And you see the both of them, they're both playing. The music is now coming from the old man because they, they strip all the music off the center one except Elvis's voice. And the music that you hear is on the, from the stage and it's all being uh, photographed by photographers wearing black, so you don't see them. But, and they're, they're on the two side screens, but we're digressing. So this is junk. Uh, now, when Elvis wants to find a little distraction, he goes back to the stage door, and there's four or five fans. I call this my Moscow shot, because it was so cold. You know, everybody's wearing like a babushka, kind of trying to keep warm. And he was beginning to start getting a straggly fan club. And maybe Ann Fulkino set the word out, hey, you know, Elvis will be there. All right, so now, Elvis was accused of having a pelvis. And some people who didn't like Elvis called him Elvis the pelvis. And this picture successfully shows that Elvis did have a pelvis, and it was in movement. And now here, he's walking out of the train station carrying the script 
of tumbleweed presley under his left arm he's got his portable transistor seven r c a radio which was the beginning of the boom box here right there only six batteries in that that unit now i think they could put you can put 30 batteries in there. Uh, but at any rate he liked to he liked to surprise people so he'd be walking into the jefferson hotel blasting away on his little transistor seven radio and he he, he liked to see people's reactions and uh, and we're now in Richmond, Virginia, and it was going to be the Elvis Presley show for two performances that afternoon and evening, or evening and later evening. And the, the way that was done was the Colonel, Colonel Tom Parker, which was his, not his real name, but that was the name he used. And he actually was an illegal immigrant from Holland who was, uh, who, who everybody assumed was Colonel Tom Parker, and that was a a name given to him by the governor of Mississippi, um, and uh, where the where the colonel was, but the, where the Parker came from is a bit of a mystery. I mean, we can argue that, but we won't. Um, so, uh, so this was leaving the railroad station, and now he's in the cab. He's sort of gawking at me, and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be a sexy look or whether it's a defiant look or whatever look it was. I never questioned what he looked like or why he did it. My job was basically, I thought, to record what he was, what his personality was. And we'll figure it out later, what he did. Now, I told you about the permitting closeness. Later on, I found out that there was one other reason why I stuck with the story, because at, at one point I was spending my hard-earned money just to stay close, and I wanted to photograph him down south with his folks in his own environment because I had gotten too much stuff in New York, and that's an artificial setting for a southern boy. So I spent my money going back with him on a 27-hour train trip, and, uh, and um, there was a point to what I was saying, but it'll come to me later, after the <laughs> lecture is over. So, so we're now heading towards the Jefferson Hotel. All right, we're in the Jefferson Hotel. His sidekick is there, probably his first bodyguard. It was his cousin, Julia Smith. And, um, and they, they were going to have something to eat. It was sort of brunch time. And the, it, this was not the coffee shop, but the actual dining room. And the waitress comes over, and she says, gentlemen, what would you like? So you notice Elvis is looking more at her than the menu. And, uh, and, and uh, so is Junior, but Junior doesn't have quite that look. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, Elvis had his arm around her waist, and, uh, and she enjoyed every moment of it. But uh, this is one of my very favorite images. I just love this image. It's beautiful. It's, it's just so typical. And you don't realize you're getting it till weeks later when it's finally developed and you, you see it on a contact sheet. You say, is this as good as I think it is? Let me make a slot print. And you blow it up and they say, yeah, it's holding up pretty well. Some of them don't hold up. But, but there's a process you go through. So now then, oh, by the way, Elvis ordered bacon and eggs, eggs over easy, with a side order of french fries, uh, uh, a half a cantaloupe with uh, ice cream, vanilla ice cream. The reason I remember it is I photographed his meat. See? So I have a good memory as long as it's on paper. So now we get to probably one of my most successful photographs that sells very well. I could retire off this and the kiss. Uh, this one is called Grilled Cheese 20 Cents. And uh, it was actually something that wasn't planned. I see the two of them sitting there. This was sort of his date for the day. And, uh, and uh, Elvis is showing her the script of the Steve Allen show where he's going to, for the first time, perform as an actor, not as just another singer. He's actually got the role that Steve wrote for him of Tumbleweed Presley. And it's in a, in a skit called Range Roundup. And Elvis ultimately 
uh, comes galloping, or so the story goes by the narration. He's galloping at 30 miles an hour, pulls out his revolver, and shoots and hits a Tonto bar being dragged across the stage by a stagehand on a nylon thread. And that was the, the punchline. You figure it out. Now everybody was supposed to laugh. And elders did all that in cowboy outfit. So he knew he was being had because Steve really was terrified of him moving around too much, which he did on a previous show with Milton Berle, where he was ostracized more or less as a disciple of the devil. And this was a few weeks later. And, uh, it was a big deal. He was really criticized. He had had those successful yeah. engagements yes. with Doisy Brothers earlier, and in that Milton Berle show, he, uh, Hound Dog, he was just making loud or singing to a microphone. And with bumping and grinding like a moment, stripper. The yes. moment after, that's how they defined it. And he yeah. was considered lousy. And Steve Allen, as one of our curators said, thought that, felt that it was his purpose to contain this evil energy, well, this rock and roll primitivism. All right. And so, <laughs> well, that's our critique. And in so doing, he can, he tried to constrain Elvis in tuxedos and singing to a hound dog. But when you see the photographs that Al captured, you see that nothing could contain Elvis. Even with all of that humiliation, he went past those bounds, I think. And he was there. You once told me, for instance, that he would listen very politely to the people behind stage when telling him not to move his hips and... Right. And, yeah, I mean, they were terrified of movement. You know, don't move. Just use your arm. Why do you have to use your hip? Why do you have to swivel so much? You know, this is America. Don't do that. And you would say he'd go on stage and do it his way. He'd do it his way. I mean, he'd listen in, uh, intently. I'm surprised he even let some of the people put their hands on him, like, now listen to me. I know the way a Morris guy, you know. To them, it was money in the bank. I mean, if he if he would listen, they they would have more or less a sure thing. If he came, if he became this rebel, this oddball, nobody quite knew. They were grooming him to become a money machine, and 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 they didn't want to put their investment, their time investment, into somebody who wasn't going to pay attention and listen. Another thing, my personal opinion was one of the reasons Elvis became as hot and as popular as he did was because James Dean had died in the fall of 1955 in a, in a crash on a, in a, a, with a farm vehicle uh, in, with his Porsche. Uh, and he, he got killed. And he was the rebel, a rebel without a cause. And, uh, and they, the band magazines were looking for a new rebel. And they started calling me for some Elvis Presley pictures, which is unheard of. They always would take Hollywood people and put them on their fan covers with Liz Taylor. Now they were they were taking record album performers and putting them on a cover. Something was unusual. They found a new rebel. Rebel sell magazine. Who buys the magazine? Teenage girls. That's that's who did it in my day. And they try who... to control that rebel. But Elvis knew. You have always described that Elvis knew where he was going, even though the William Morrison people or the RCA people thought he could contain it, he shouldn't move so much. He knew there was another audience out there that understood what he was doing. He was speaking a rebel voice. He was freeing the youth, uh, the, word, the, the, the voice of the young. He was opening the mainstream stage to African-American rhythm for young people and allowing young women the right to know that they could feel sensuality. That was big. That was rebellion. That was mid 20th century, and you caught that. Well, if I caught it, I caught it, despite myself. <laughs> I mean, you, you see, if you don't argue with the scene, record it, and then discuss it a year or two later, that's fine. At least you did your job of being the messenger. Uh, if you're going to try to start editing while you're shooting, Forget about it. I mean, it'll drive you crazy. The problem with these cameras, with digital cameras, is uh, I, I go to China. I'm, I'm, I've got an exhibit there. I'm, I came back with like 4,000 images. I don't know what to do with them all. I mean, just filing them. But at night, when I'd be back at the hotel, what am I doing? I'm editing my work from the afternoon, and I'm dumping like half of the pictures because film is, I mean, digital imagery is so cheap that you can take 
2,000 images and throw away a thousand because if a better frame comes along, you don't want to save all the crappy frames. You couldn't do that uh, with mo with film because first of all, you only have 36 exposures on the roll, and so when I get down to 30 frames shot, I'd have to be very careful how I use the other six frames. So I'd have to hold back and say, is this good enough to push the button? Not like they have now with motorized cameras, boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here I've got something in here, I could do six, seven hundred frames, just like that. But we're digressing. There's a, <laughs> just, just, uh, we got grilled cheese, 20 cents, lettuce and tomato, 25. Those who can't read this, uh, what, if, what do we have? Chicken salads of 30 cents. The people are so nostalgic for those old time prices that they love that photograph. They, you don't even know it's Elvis and who the girl is. They just look at the menu up there and they say, oh, when, well, when, when Obama brings those prices back, we're, we're going to... It's a perfectly composed uh, image. Yeah, well, but you see, it was only one frame and it was... I, I saw it and I knew if I stopped yes. to fool around too much, it would change. So sometimes you grab oh. things and you're lucky. In the now, moment, that's the art. Now, in this particular picture, he's got his hand up to the ear. We're in the green room of the mosque theater. Uh, the colonel would rent the theater for the day. He'd have, be able to get two bookings. He'd put Tom Diskin in as the uh, box office man. And he'd, uh, he'd hustle uh, some high school students to help hand out various flyers and bill, uh, playbills. And, uh, and Elvis is in rehearsal with the Jordanaires here, and he can't hear himself think, let alone sing, and find out what they're doing. Why? Because the girls outside this window are screaming, Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. And, uh, and so he eventually goes to the window, he says, listen girl, we're trying to rehearse. Could you please tone it down? You know what? They toned it down. They listened to him. Amazing. So look, he's got white bucks on, a little bit like Pat Boone. Uh, and and uh, and he also had a very thin belt. Uh, so now we come to the mystery lady. That was his date for the day, um, and uh, everybody thinks she's six foot tall because in the in the picture you'll see later, which is called the kiss, uh, she and Elvis are both at the same height. But in reality, she's under five foot. She's a trifle under five foot. She's got like three four inch heels here. And she's on her tippy toes, just about reaches Elvis's nose. And while this picture is taking place, there's the acts taking place on stage. The other nine acts that the Colonel book. And Elvis, on the Elvis Presley show, only closes the show. The last 15 minutes are his. In the meantime, he's got to do something. So, so he's been trying to kiss this gal uh, now all day long. And... Uh, she appeared at the Jefferson Hotel, and she was actually invited by him, even though he didn't know exactly her face, because she, he, he spoke to her on the telephone, and one of his later bodyguards went and picked her up and brought her to the, brought her to the, uh, uh, to the hotel. And, uh, and so she... Um, well, there she is, and, uh, and it, it's, it, it, oh, I know what, I know what. I was upstairs uh, in the dressing room. The dressing room was the men's room, you see? And, uh, and the Jordanaires were there, some of the other musicians were there, mostly men in the performance of the various acts. And Elvis was busy combing his hair, and Junior Smith was encouraging him, and Elvis liked Junior a lot, and, and Junior loved Elvis. I mean, they truly loved him. I mean, you, you wouldn't want to be caught in, a, in an alley with this guy at night, but, but he, he was showing good respect, and so he was part of the family. After all, Gladys Smith was a Smith, and he was also a Smith, so they called him Junior Smith. And so I got involved with the Jordanaires, photographing them, and then that's a mistake, because if your assignment is Elvis Presley, you don't get sidetracked by another performer because your main character disappears. So I looked around, there was no Elvis. I said, Al, Al you're making a mistake. Where is Elvis? Go find Elvis. So, um, 
So I go down the fire stair, which is here, to the, to the floor on which the performances are taking place, and I see this silhouette, these silhouettes at the end of a long, narrow uh, hallway with uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, a little window here and a small bulb on top of their head. And I said, okay, this is going to push available, but available um, light photography into something I coined later on, which was available darkness photography. And uh, available darkness photography, in my mind,